now from Hollywood, California, the horror capital of the world, the Boulay Brothers, Creatures of the Night. Hello, my haunted little heathens, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Boulet Brothers, Brothers, Creatures Creatures of the the Night. We will be your guides through the shadows, the queens of darkness, the Boulet Brothers, Swanthula, and (laughs) Drakmorda. Oh, I totally approve of that delivery. Yes, Drak. Yes, I'm getting into this mood already. Why don't we talk about what we've been up to over the last week? Sure. Okay. I think the highlight of what we've been up to, we've been busy. Everybody knows that things are coming down the pipeline Mm -hmm. and they're almost here. So I appreciate everyone's patience online, but we're working very hard in the background and everything. But something cool that we did uh, this last week was we visited some haunts, some dark rides and haunt attractions in South Carolina. Yeah, and it was so fun, and we love to take this opportunity anywhere we go, whether it is a county fair, local, if we're traveling and we happen to be in a town, we're like, wait, I think they have a haunt down there, or there's a carnival, and we go and we figure out exactly like where the dark ride is, and we make sure we experience it. Yeah, I, I am obsessed with it. I love the history of them. I love the really old ones, although I did go to one that was too old. <laughs> the one in Japan. The one in Japan. Yes. It was a dark <laughs> ride that you got in a cart, and it went on a little like roller coaster through this, quote, haunt. It was, um, it was, it wasn't it good. Was, yeah, it was creative. <laughs> it, but it was old, right? It was interesting to see like what the take on horror was. But yes, I think that's literally the oldest, the oldest dark carnival ride. or like yeah. uh, amusement in was it Kyoto? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was kind of cool. But these were not quite that old. The ones that we went to uh, recently. So we went to the Nightmare Haunted House which is in Myrtle Beach on the boardwalk there. And that haunted house has actually been there for a long time. It's been there since the 80s. Their current theme is like a zombie kind of thing, right? Yeah. But it wasn't always that. Used to, it was just sort of like a classic haunted house. And I can tell you, because I have been to this haunted house a million times. And, you know, when I went there and I w- when I was younger... Uh, I went there when I was very, very young, and people used to crowd outside of that haunt at the bottom of the stairs because every couple of minutes, people would come falling down the stairs onto the boardwalk because they were so terrified. Yes. You'd hear screams from in there, and so there would be a crowd gathered around, and a lot of people were afraid to go in it because it was that scary. And you saw, I think, uh, as we were talking to them, It's still ranked as one of the top 25 scariest haunted houses in the country. Yeah, it really did. And you would never guess it from the street level. You can see the staircase and you can kind of hear it, but you can't see anything. And the building actually looks deceptively small. Yes. And then you get up there and it's like one of those haunts where there's no one in front of you, no one behind you. You're literally alone. And in our case, it's the two of us. We are literally alone in there. I mean, in a full blackout hallway is where it starts. And then they're like, taunting you you can hear them it's really different because i'm really used to like not scary farm and universal yeah. where the soundscape is like so overloading and and i think even that has there's a method to that madness because you can't anticipate or hear anyone coming up on you but this place at myrtle beach was sort of the opposite because you could hear everything and it was menacing they would run at you they would run after you and so i mean look you know because we talk about this i don't get scared in haunted house no you d- like i, I don't and I was totally scared in this haunted house. Yes, and I, was, I know. We were running through it. I hurt my <laughs> foot. We were ramming into walls and oh, stuff. I mean, we. it was like, I don't know what happened. It but was so fun. I was feeding off of your fear, too, because I was like, oh, my God, Drag is scared. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> we were like running You couldn't tell where it was coming from. And then they were grabbing you yeah. from over the wall and, and stuff. Then, and I was just like, this you is a lot. Uh, The tall one's mine. And I'm like, oh, my God, why don't they want me? I'm kidding. (laughs) 
So that was fine. Yeah. The, well, there was another discovery, too, because it's not the only haunt on the boardwalk. <laughs> oh, we right. actually went to another one across the street. And this is part of like the Ripley's mm-hmm. presence on the boardwalk in Myrtle Beach. And this is Ripley's Haunted Adventure right there on the main boardwalk. And what we discovered was two things where the first haunt had like a bunch of scare actors. This one had one. Which isn't necessarily totally like a bad thing because they actually did a great job. To our surprise, we knew the girl that was running it. It was Nightingale Triple X. Yeah, this was literally Nightingale Triple X's <laughs> haunted house experience. Literally, I'm like, it we was wa- her. It was. This is exactly who we reference when we when we created Nightingale yeah, Triple so X. So we walked up and the ticket takers there and she's like, "Okay, let me get your tickets. Okay, so here's what you're going to do. Stand against the wall. Okay, now this video is going to play and blah blah blah." And then and then she's like, "Oh, I'm going to be right back. I think I hear someone in the front." Right? Yeah, so, so she, she but, but at first you don't you're like, "Okay, she's like just a worker or whatever." But then you start to figure out that it is her following you through the whole thing. And you know what? It was a little bit scary. It was scary. also scary. Yeah. It was. There were some moments where they do this thing with like complete blackout. So you're like, what the hell? And then your lights adjust. I mean, um, and then your eyes adjust because a little bit of light gets let in. It made no sense at all. But you'd walk into a room and there'd be like writing on the wall and a weird fireplace. And all of a sudden the fireplace would open and she would jump out and you'd scream and run. It was kind of great. I don't know what it is about that area, but there are a ton of haunts that have come in and out through history. You know, there was that... uh Magic Harbor that we covered on the podcast before yeah. that had the Black Witch roller coaster where someone died. There's just a lot of creepy stuff in that area. I, and if you look into the history of it, I think it was originally supposed to be settled as one of the first American settlements in the country. Hmm. And it, it didn't work. And there's like, so there's all this weird haunted history to it. Yeah. So if you're interested in, in the history of old haunts or dark rides, definitely check out Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, because there are a lot there. A lot of fun. So we are going to do things a little bit differently on this episode of Creatures of the Night and answer all of your listener questions first, since we've been kind of getting in the habit of like skipping them. So I think that there's a lot of good ones and they're sort of backed up. So we want to make sure we make some time for that. And then we'll be moving on to our Junior Mints Movie Club review of Cuckoo. (laughs) Now, Jack and I referenced this last episode. It was all about Romulus, but we snuck out and watched Cuckoo and... (laughs) <laughs> we'll, we'll get there, but it was a pleasant surprise, I'll have to say. But before we go any further, we're going to take a quick break and we will be right back. Welcome back to the Blood Banks Uglies. It's time we're joined by our cadaverous co-host and our favorite blood doll, Ian DeVogler. Ian, welcome back to the show. Oh, I'm feeling a little woozy. <laughs> Hello. How are you both? We're great. How are you? Good. I am feeling flirty today. I am loving this episode so much, and I cannot wait to dig into those listener questions when we get there. She's feeling flirty. She's feeling fun. She's Ooh, feeling fabulous. Yes. And I just have to point out again, she is very juicy. She has juiced up, so as far as a blood doll, she's, she's, she can feed she's quite serving, an army. She's serving milk. Listen. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god whoa i was ho- whoa ho- ho- ho. i was gonna say y'all are so busy these days i gotta make sure that there is enough blood in this bank honey oh, yeah they're thirsty gals keep it going <laughs> we've been doing a lot and girl i am tired <laughs> well you look fabulous she is sleepy <laughs> we're very busy but thank you oh so should we start with some listener questions and then we'll do the movie reviews? Yeah. Oh, I'm kind of dying to sink our fangs into them. Okay, let's do it. Ray from Alberta, Canada writes, Love the podcast, and I do believe I'm with the majority of listeners when it comes to a Drax rant corner being the most enjoyable segment. But as a comic store owner, please consider Drax Comic Corner. Even as a weekly TikTok, maybe? Seeing the season five X-Men styled hair you had gave me life. 
My question, though, a previous listener mentioned a D&D game they were running, and it got me thinking. A Boulay Brothers Halloween-inspired campaign where you play out a slasher film or other horror-related topics seems brilliant and definitely something I could sell at my store, Mythic Comics. Would you ever be interested in doing something like that? I mean, it sounds fun to me. I don't know how that works. Like, I don't know. Do people make campaigns... I know you can buy scripts, right? So you can yeah. buy packages where you're like, you're going to go do Strahd's Castle or this is the abandoned pirate ship or whatever. And it's like a little pack that you can buy with a book to follow and all the monsters and everything is sort of like included. So it, it kind of seems possible and very fun. Yeah. I mean, I never really, when I DM games, I never followed this tale. Or like I kind of made up my own world. Me and too. Yeah. Everything. Same. So it would be very easy to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you think about this idea of like a Drax, um, what did she call it? Like a bitching out corner? <laughs> comic, comic books. <laughs> Drax no, rant corner. Drax and rant comic. corner. And yeah. The, yeah, the comics would be so good. I mean, honestly, they'd be the same because I pretty much hate most <laughs> comics nowadays. So it would just be about me bitching about how they don't understand the characters or yeah. the histories of them or whatever. It sounds perfect. <laughs> Comic bitch. That's what I'll call it. Yes. Yes. Comic bitch on TikTok. Wow. Don't steal the name. Pristine Decay asks, I just finished the latest episode and couldn't agree with you more. The looks you mentioned are staples of the show and iconic in their own right. You mentioned wanting to do more, quote, top 10 lists for future shows. And I'm wondering, what are your top five or 10 least favorite looks and why? Pristine Decay is so shady. <laughs> so shady. And I applaud you for that. <laughs> I don't think we would be comfortable revealing that. I mean, there may be. What do you think? Is there any that stand out that you're like, I need to talk about well, this? Well, we talked a little bit about this already, and I think we re we redirected that arrow back at ourselves and said, what are our least favorite looks that we have worn? Right. And I think it's a little safer to do that because people can, can handle not being on the top 10 list of the best looks, but I don't know if everyone can handle the insult of making the list of the worst looks. Yes, and I will say there would be some that come from season one, but in their defense... There was no Dragula before season one, so they really didn't have anything to reference. They didn't know how big the show was going to get. I mean, can you? I mean, at the time when we yeah. filmed season one, they would have never dreamed that they would be on the wall right now. And as we look <laughs> on the wall, they're the first poster, the yeah. first frame picture on the wall of the season one cast. And I'm sure they had no idea when they shot that, that now look all yeah. the way down the wall. I totally agree. And honestly, as I look at the season one poster, it still looks pretty cool. It's I, I'm happy with it. It's, it's totally iconic. Yeah. Well, I, I did, uh, have it remastered a couple of times uh. <laughs> for real. Oh, I had, details, yeah. details, details. Okay. It, it was a little rough. <laughs> I gotta say of all the meet our monsters filming days, I remember season one and season three the most. Really? Oh, really? Absolutely. I remember season one, like, Pretty much every single person I remember, like crystal clear. There's just, and I guess it really is. It's like the magic of season one and sort of all the fruit that's yeah. come from it. Yeah, and and so much DNA is established then, and not all from us. Even though all you know, tons of our ideas were poured into the show, and you still see them now years later. But the competitors like the blood bath gag with the uh, watering mm -hmm. can and the brain reveal in, <sighs> in Vander's like meet our monsters is still iconic to this day. Oh yeah. That has been imitated to good or bad effect so many times yeah, since that. I know season two really sticks out for me too. Cause I remember we were filming in a different uh, space and James like lit his hands on fire oh and God, like Kendra yeah. was like licking off the floor and a bore with the balloons. Like I really remember that mm -hmm. season three. I really remember because y'all stomped it mama oh, I that's remember. right there's this one video I thought oh, we it. did do that didn't we <laughs> oh wait oh hold on yeah there's this one video that i have i think it's still on my phone somewhere but it's literally it's a bts video where y'all are getting your photo taken and you just look immaculate like you just look like dolls it's crazy i've like, seen that video yeah. before and it, it's weird it looks like we're like animations come to life or yeah. something. I, I can't explain it, but it's it looks so like cool. we're not real. It's something about strange. the way we painted that season too, because it's so 
much starker. I feel like I when, do too. when you look at that poster, our skin tone, I mean, we must've not been out in the sun for like a year and a half before we did that photo yeah, shoot. Now it's been 10. <laughs> <laughs> I know like family members saw me while we were traveling and we, we talked about a lot of things, of course, but one of the things was like, damn, you guys are really white. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, sorry, I haven't been out in the sun in four years. <laughs> Dan from Baltimore writes, I saw y'all attended the Alien Romulus premiere, and I'm wondering how far can you see with your contacts in? Do you have different ones for public appearances and on screen, or did you have to take them out when the movie started? It has been a trial and error nightmare that we never find the conclusion to. I wore, we, we got some special customized lenses for the Boogeyman premiere, mm -hmm. which we went to with David, and that was a total mistake. Yeah. yeah. Really? Because they actually were prescription. So I got a prescription oh. built into them. I was like, I'm going to be great. Cause I'm going <laughs> to, you know, cause we're going to see a movie, you know, but the way that they were made, your eye, like the place that your eye saw through was like really small. Oh. And then that smallness was for distance vision. I, I just ended up like, and I was stuck like that. I didn't have any. Oh my God. So I just like had a headache and we went to the after party. I was like, I got to go. I can't see anybody. And I was so pissed. I wanted to stay at that after party. It was really, really <laughs> cute. <laughs> yeah. Some of the stars from, uh, Yellow Jackets was there and like oh, the director cool. and I was like, oh, I want to be here. And Jack's like, I can't see. And I'm like, that's not new. <laughs> <laughs> as far as the blinds for the Romulus premiere, we don't cut corners generally, but we knew that we wouldn't be able to see that screen. So we, we brought our backup eyes with the pupils. So we came in blind, popped in the pupils for the show and then popped the blinds back in to exit the theater. LJ asks, Swan. A24 announced that the X trilogy is getting turned into a novelization, specifically pulpy paperbacks to be reminiscent of the 80s. Could these paperbacks be added to the book nook? I love the idea of pulpy paperbacks, but I don't love the idea of a novelization of some shit I've already seen. Like, I don't <laughs> think I'm into that. And, and Ian, you mentioned something recently, too. There was a novelization. come. Oh, it was Terrifier, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's coming out. And I'm like, I don't get that. I really don't. I would just watch the damn movie again as opposed to like reading, reading it. Novelizations are a strange beast for me because I feel like, you know, we, we watch adaptations in the other direction. We'll watch like, oh, this, this was a book or this was a comic book and it got made into a movie. But there's just something about going the opposite way that feels strange. Like, I don't know. It feels like for me, like writing a novel is such a like personalized craft. Like every yeah. author has such a specific way that they write. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. So no, the answer is the no. answer be no. <laughs> <laughs> so no. <laughs> Sister Mary Catherine mayhem from Colorado asks, as an unwashed Midwestern rube, I love, love, love hearing your stories about your time working in nightlife. Nightlife is such an ephemeral thing. In the time before social media and cell phones, if you missed it, you missed out. Since I was too busy living in the middle of nowhere, I'd love to hear about any shows or parties that you used to host slash perform in that you either loved or hated. <laughs> oh my God, that list is too huge. It uh, is. Our roots are deeply planted in the nightlife. I mean, Creatures of the Night sort of comes from, yes, it's a reference to Rocky Horror, but it also is about like where our drag and where our aesthetic comes from. It's yeah, definitely totally. nightlife. God, there's tons of parties that, that were really fun. I mean, I think she's right in saying, if you weren't there, you missed it. And that's sort of the truth of even telling these stories. I'm like, it, there's no way you could get people to understand. And one thing that I think is cool, though, is no matter what year it was, from the first year we started doing parties, we started the Los Angeles Halloween Ball. And we had this one, which I, th I think listeners probably know, we had this one jack-o'-lantern that was like <gasps> foam and carved yes. that was at the first one. And it has been in every Halloween party since then. With us the whole time. Yeah. So. And actually, I'm going to go ahead and say it. We're, God. we're going to give away a replica of it. If you pre-save our new music that's coming out, but we'll do the link and all that stuff later when it gets closer. Yeah. I'm actually going to age it and like hand paint it and make it like a very special thing. So that is definitely on the way. That is so cool. Can yeah. I do like multiple entries? Yeah, please do. Okay, perfect. I will. Definitely. 
Iri asks, as much as I love horror movies, I also love the Real Housewives franchises. What are your thoughts on Jennifer Tilly officially joining the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills? I'm hoping that she will have a tagline that references Chucky slash Tiffany. Follow up question. What is your favorite Housewives tagline? Well, I love that Jennifer Tilly is joining the cast of the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. I mean, this is a serving of real Hollywood culture in Beverly Hills. And they're, you know, adjacent with each other for people that are not that familiar with the geography of Los Angeles. It just makes sense. Yeah. And also her and Sutton are close friends in real life. And we've seen her on the show before. Yeah. Not as a friend of, but just making appearances. But I have seen lots of behind the scene photos from this upcoming season of Beverly Hills and Jennifer Tilly's in like all the scenes she is. She went to everything and you know, I think she is going to have a big personality. On yeah. That show. I think she's going to show up. It, it excites me to see her in all those photos because you don't necessarily know if it's like your first season or if you're technically a housewife or not. And I think she's going to show up and I think she's going to have stuff to say. And it's going to be in that amazing voice of hers. It's going to be great. Yeah. And cool. she's in a, another series coming up this year, which I think we'll be able to talk about maybe in a week. Or two. Yeah. Very exciting. <laughs> very exciting. And what's our favorite tagline? Oh, I don't know. Um, I do. I don't think I don't think it's my favorite tagline ever, but it's probably my favorite tagline from the franchise that we're watching right now, which is the Real Housewives of Orange County, which is the only thing stuck up about me is my middle finger. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I, I'm not a tagline girl. I'm not, I'm not like a tagline. Like I don't remember them and all. And I was, I'm usually rolling my eyes at them cause they're kind of yeah. cringy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but I don't know. I, what was the other question? How about uh, Jack? This one is very you. Well, you're taking cheap shots. I'm taking screenshots. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jersey's dead, by the way, isn't it? It it's is. Never coming back. It is on the slab in the morgue, ready for the drawer forever. It really is. I don't think they're they're either not going to bring it back. They're going to recast the whole thing. It's crazy. It's it's a mess. Ian doesn't care, but Irie does because they are a a smart listener. <laughs> Someone who loves not only not only Dracula but also the Real Housewives. I have tried to get Ian into it so many times, and it just doesn't work. But. That's one of the things we can talk to Casey, who also works exactly. in the office about, because she loves it. She loves it. So here's my thing with like getting into the old seasons. It's like watching classic films sometimes. It's like you watch, and I'm like, this is old. <laughs> like, it's old, and it's like, and I know it's going to accelerate and get to like the pacing now, but it's yeah. like, even like when I was watching like New York and Atlanta, like, the older seasons, they're great. Yeah. Like, they are great. Mm -hmm. But they move at a pace sometimes. And I'm like, so you're just going to lunch. Like, yeah, it's yeah, really okay. different. It's yeah, really it's, different. It, now, it's, like, so fast sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like, Jersey slow in the beginning. It, oh, my, oh, did you think so? Yeah. Like, actually... The first season is slow until they have that dinner and all hell breaks loose. Oh, yeah. And then every season after yeah. that's been insane. Well, they kick off season two, I think, with the christening, and it's just it, it just ex <laughs> it ramps up from there. <laughs> the christening. Eric writes, "How do you feel about the recent surge of Halloween content curated by a wave of twee earnest influencers? As someone in their forties who once had to dig through niche retailers for macabre finds, it's strange to see Halloween now dominated by influencer moms and major retailers. While I'm not into gatekeeping, I can't help but question the irony of former cheerleaders and wine moms co-opting what was once a niche goth aesthetic. Is this just another phase of American consumerism, or should we embrace the broader availability of Halloween culture?" It's kind of like pumpkin spice lattes, right? We can all enjoy them, even a wine mom, even like a basic bitch girl who, who's just out there somewhere in suburbia. Like, I'm like, the more the merrier. Let's have a party. This is something that we celebrate every year and have forever. It speaks to my heart. And just because you're pretending that it speaks to your heart for a minute doesn't take away from me. <laughs> Well, I, I'm not into protectionists. Like, I'm not into to protecting subcultures. There was someone on the show one time that was like that, who was very like, <laughs> everything has to be pure punk and this. And I'm like, that is ridiculous. Who like, could you, you mean? Are I in wonder. Eighth grade. You know what I mean? It's absurd. I love Halloween and I love people to love Halloween. Yeah. The more people that love Halloween, the better for all of us. Because, like the, the listener said, Back in the day, you'd have to dig around to find Halloween stuff, and now you can find it at Home Goods and this and that. I'm like, great. 
I love it because it's more for us. I know. know. And it's, you know, the, the more glory to the gods of Halloween, the more powerful and beautiful and young we get. Yes. The bigger Halloween gets, the bigger we get. So <laughs> I'm all for it. Grannies, Marthas. Yes. Wine moms and everybody in between. Well, also, I got to say, and maybe this is just my generation, but I'm like, no one love Halloween, even if it's just for that one night only, than slutty cheerleader wine mom. Yeah. Like, oh, Halloween's yeah. the one time a year you get to dress like a slut and no one mm-hmm. says anything about it. Like, and get all the into- husbands get to do drag. Oh, yeah. But listen, <laughs> the, the gays really know the secret on that. The yeah. truth is... You can dress like a slut every day. Look if at you me, want honey. To. <laughs> I always think that when people come to the Halloween bond, it's like people we know, uh-huh. right? Like we all know, yep. and, and people are like, "What kind of slutty outfit are they going to wear this year?" And I was like. I don't really know what else they could do because I see what they wear to the club and I'm like, I mean, totally. how much smaller can it get? Well, I think for Halloween, it's like it's the same level. It's the same amount of fabric, but just with a theme, yes. you know, it's, it's yes. like because you can't just be like, hey, I'm in the office today as slutty nurse. You know, I mean, you could, you but could. I mean, you might get fired or you might get on TikTok and get famous. Who knows? Matt asks. With the haunt season approaching, maze builds around SoCal are getting their final touches before hitting the catwalk. If you were to design your own Halloween haunt mazes, what would you do? Well, I would definitely ruin people's clothing. And yes. I would tell them that ahead of time. So I'd be like, wear your trashiest, trashy clothes, your patchwork pants, everything that's awful that you almost are about to throw away because you're going to want to throw it away when we get done with you. I'm also into not just the audio of the haunted house, but smells, right? Like, mm. I don't know if you're into haunts, you know that if you're deep into haunts, not like a light haunter, there are scents that you can buy. And it really changes the vibe of each room that you go into. So I would do a lot of that as well. Definitely some dropping out of the floor. Like it would be dangerous. Let me just put it that way. That's kind of my answer too. I don't think I know exactly what I would do, but I could tell you this. There would be epilepsy warnings. You'd have to sign a waiver. You might get touched and you might get hurt and you will definitely get scared. I definitely would have it where someone would get pied from your party. <gasps> Love that. Definitely. I mean, I would just really <laughs> torment people. It would be fabulous. <laughs> Jay writes, Hi, I'm a longtime Dead by Daylight player and streamer, and before the collab announcement, I had no idea who you gals were. Sorry, I'm new to the Blade Brothers Dragula and drag in general, and I'm not trying to offend. Someone posted your podcast on the DVD Reddit. Long story short, I listened to the episode and binged the first season and starting the second. I am hooked. I guess my one burning question is, what killers do you two play as? This is so great because the irony of the wording of Jay's comment, get hooked is the name of episode (laughs) one for season two. So oh bitch, God, you are so cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, first of all, I love to hear that. I love, yeah. love, love new people. Everyone is welcome. So definitely enjoy the show. And yeah, no offense at all. I mean, no. everybody discovers cool shit at various points and like, welcome to the dark side. And the thing is, I've played all the killers in Dead by Light, Daylight because I want to figure out who, you know, who gets who who's the better player. There's some of them. I don't want to throw them under the bus that are but they're just not. They're not They're it. They're not it. They're yeah. not it. Ooh. <laughs> exactly. Um, I really like the hillbilly. I have mm. a lot of fun with that, with that killer. So, Sean Kelly asks, with your new Halloween album coming out, do you have any artists or songs you would say inspire the album? Trying to add to my Halloween playlist for this year. Oh, for sure. It's very inspired by 60s retro spooky music, I would say. You know, like, absolutely. I think as far as like other people that you can add to your spooky collection, we have a playlist that we made during the pandemic that was like the Boulay Brothers Halloween at Home playlist. Yeah. I think I'm going to add that to our artist profile on Spotify so everybody can listen to it. So look for that soon because we're going to add it as a playlist and you can see a lot of the music that influenced us for this album. Again, we wanted it to be the new holiday Halloween album that yes, wine moms can also listen to. <laughs> Please do actually and share it with your friends. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. Um, Rate, subscribe and review. Please follow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but, and, and I think all the songs, really all of them could go on that playlist yes, for Halloween. And they will. 
Derek Tasky from Michigan asks, With the love of Dungeons and Dragons and role-playing games I hear on the pod and see in Dragula, it makes me wonder if any of you have played Baldur's Gate 3 or have any interest in it. Oh, I want to play so badly. I have not played. When you say it, I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm missing out. I have total FOMO. Um, But I I haven't played video games in a while just because I've been so busy with like film projects and stuff. But Baldur's Gate is on my horizon. Did you play it? I did. What did did you think of it? It's fabulous. Like if you like D&D, it is the go-to. Like Swan, I think that you would be obsessed with it. Drac, I think you would absolutely love it. I had to really check myself because I wrecked myself. I was like, oh, I'm hard. I'm hardcore. I can play this on the hard difficulty. And I was like, "Uh -uh." uh-uh. Because it's like, it's it's all about, like the combat is very strategy based. And so I got really overwhelmed. I was like, ooh, okay, Eldritch Blast Pussy. And then it was like, not the T. So wait, so you don't go up and like hit someone with your sword. You you take turns. It's all turn based. It's just like D&D combat. Are you serious? It's very in depth. Is it boring? No, it's really fabulous. I might have to try that. I've played turn based fighting games before in RPGs and they can work. I love like PVP and like just out there in the field, like cutting people up. But like the turn-based strategies are kind of fun too in a different way. <laughs> Do you remember that old Final Fantasy one? Yes. Where you'd be trying to get across the board and all of a sudden it pulls you into the split screen. You're like, no, <laughs> God, stop it. Yes. <laughs> and you'd be like, well, that's all of our listener questions for this episode. Thank you all for writing in. We love to field those questions. And if you have more questions about upcoming projects or anything from the world of the Blade Brothers, Dragula, Creatures of the Night, our music, or any of our projects, please write in to creatures at bladebrothersdragula.com. We are going to take our second break of the evening. And when we return, we will be digging into the corpse of this episode's Junior Mints Movie Club Review, Cuckoo. Stay tuned, uglies. All right, my darlings, we are back, and it's time we move on to this episode's Junior Mints Movie Club Review. As mentioned last episode, we snuck in a trip to Alamo Draft House to see Cuckoo, even though last week was all about Alien, and this was a film that we had had only heard about, didn't really know anything about the plot or anything other than it was supposed to be scary, and Hunter Schaefer was starring in it. So we checked it out, and I will speak for myself, I was delighted by this movie. So we've decided to review Tillman Singer, the writer and director's film Cuckoo. Well, I'm glad that we did this because we saw it before Ian. Then I was happy that you went to see it and you liked it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, we have to talk about it. Yeah. Because there's a lot to talk about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Where should we start? I mean, here's the thing, right? Exactly. Because it is wild. It is like unbridled and, and strange and crazy. And while I was sitting down trying to organize this Junior Men's Movie Club review, I'm like, Okay, the review is just going to be as wild and unbridled and strange because it's hard to organize. Well, then let's mm-hmm. start with this. When we when you f- saw the first scene, the opening scene, you see the girl run out of the house into mm-hmm. the wood. Did you all have any clue what this movie was about? Absolutely not. No there was way. no way to see it coming. And and what I quickly discovered was, oh, okay, self, this is not the movie I thought I was coming to see because the trailers and and all the teasers really kind of painted a different picture, like mental health crisis Mm -hmm. and like an isolated location. And you know, there's a little bit of that, but it's not really what the movie's about at all. Yeah. 100%. I think that that feeling of, Oh, I have no idea what's going on. That continues up until for me, like the 70% mark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the way that it unfolds, I love this movie. Like I, I weird horror. Yes, ma'am. I, I think that's what's very well done about this. Like the audience is held in a limbo kind of like where anything is possible and you don't really know what's going on. And the buildup is kind of familiar. We've seen it in other movies before where the protagonist arrives in a strange location. Everything isn't quite what it seems. Um, But then, I mean, Cuckoo just like kind of stretches the boundaries of reality and possibility. And it becomes a movie unlike any other I've ever really seen. Okay, so why don't I read the synopsis and then we'll kind of take it from there. So reluctantly, 17-year-old Gretchen leaves her American home to live with her father, who has just moved into a resort in the German Alps with his new family. Arriving at their future residence, they are greeted by Eric Koenig, 
her father's boss, who takes an inexplicable interest in Gretchen's mute half-sister, Alma. Something doesn't seem right in this tranquil vacation paradise. Gretchen is plagued by strange noises and bloody visions until she discovers a shocking secret that also concerns her own family. So even with that, you don't know. You're like, what? What is this movie about? Nope. I think that you could take that synopsis. And even though it does start to pick away at the plot, it in no way gives anything away about what this movie is actually about. It is bizarre. (laughs) It really is. I mean, okay, let's just talk about each character is so strange. Even like Mr. Koenig, it's like. Who is this sleazy pervert that I know Ian loves? <laughs> oh my god. Okay. I'm Did sorry. you like him? Oh, I'm sorry. When you were like, where do we start? I'm over here. I'm like, I know exactly where I'm Really? Start. That doesn't seem like a type of guy I would think you were into. I don't know what it is about. It's Dan Stevens and Kyle Gallner. I'm like, these two horror hunks are so <laughs> slutty with their little mustaches. I'm like, get back on my screen. <laughs> well, one of the things that weirded me out the most was remember there's the other girl that works at the front. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And things start happening with her, right? And you're like, what is happening Mm -hmm. with this girl? You know, she's somehow part of it. It's the sliming part. So yeah. The slime from the crotch is when a she little gets, weird. When she when she got slimed, I'm like, I, well, in my head, I was like, there is no way that they're going to make <laughs> this make sense. This is bullshit. There's no way. But they did. They yeah. did. Every, they actually did. <laughs> it's interesting. I feel like I've seen a lot of people talk about this film online from a, unfortunately, a negative perspective. And oh, be, really? Yeah. I've seen people who are like, I really didn't like it. I thought it was a flop. I didn't get it. I just, I'm not into this. And to that, ah, there was another movie that we reviewed and I can't remember what it was. Oh, it was uh, Malignant. Where I'm oh. like, I'm sorry that you don't get it, but yeah. I love it. It's so cuckoo bananas. Like, yeah. and it, 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 I feel like it does make sense. I'm like, I get it, mama. It's complicated. Maybe. You don't see it coming. When the credits were rolling, I was like, now wait a minute (laughs) i need i need a drink i need a couple of ibuprofen and i need a google to like figure out exactly what i just saw but i knew i liked it yeah Yeah. we went to see it with a bunch of people that make movies and love you know they're cinephiles and they really liked it Mm -hmm. you know especially after uh they did not love alien romulus actually interesting yeah Yeah. but they loved it they were like this is a good refresher and then he also went to see deadpool and wolverine Mm -hmm. and was like I can't with American movies right now. And then he watched this and he was like, I'm happy again. I was like, okay, cool. But I I don't know. I thought that the creature, I guess we'll Mm -hmm. say, right. I couldn't believe that they went there because it seems like from a comic book or something. Oh, uh, I mean, completely. Well, the the atmosphere that it exists in too, like the atmosphere and the tension, especially at the beginning, was so great. I mean, it was just, it was literally creepy, and and I, you just didn't know what was going to happen. There's that scene where you see uh, the creature. I think they call her like the hooded woman or something. Where Gretchen is riding her bike home because Air Koenig oh <laughs> gave her a job at the lobby, and she, he's like, "Don't go home by yourself." And she's like, "I got this." So she's on her bike, and then you see the figure just like jet out from the the pink cabin and then you see the shadow play i mean you could tell it didn't have the hugest budget we're not dealing with like major special effects here but the reality of how scary and cool that was it was like registering very high that scene is terrifying and it also it comes i think on the heels of the first time that in retrospect, we realize that it's the hooded woman or it's these cuckoo's powers and yeah. that sort of weird, like, do, 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 like, like that throat yeah. movement. Yeah. I was like, what is this? Like, this is like, so it's like Lynchian. It's yeah. like, it's like blue velvet. Yeah. And it's just so strange. Kind of part monster movie. Like it was a yeah. mystery. Yeah. So what did you think of the reveal of what, I mean, and there was multiple of them, yeah. obviously. Now, were there multiple ones in the woods that just looked similar in the same costume, or was that mm-hmm. one? I think that was just the one. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and she was like kind of the matriarch, right? She mm-hmm. was the mother to oh, right. Alma being the cuckoo bird, like kind of planted <sighs> into another family. So the breakdown is like this. We we eventually learn that Gretchen's sister Alma, the, the mute girl, is actually a member of a mysterious human-like race that relies on brood parasiticism. <laughs> brood <just>, parasiticism. 
<laughs> uh, much like cuckoo birds, the birds would place their young amongst a different species of birds' babies until the time it reaches maturity to join its own species. Why did it do that? Why? What, why couldn't it just raise its own, like, bird killer? I mean, I think that type of question is also... In the context of the film, it's like asking, like, why doesn't the cuckoo bird do it? It's like, why can't she fly? That's another question. You're right, Jack. Well, actually, Swan, why can't Miss Cuckoo fly? It's just a survival mechanism, right? Like, <laughs> the animal world is vast and strange, and that actually happens in the animal world. And I think people forget sometimes we are part of the animal world. Right. So, yeah. was she an experiment? Or was she natural? What do you guys think? I thought she was natural. And it makes me think about sort of my favorite aspect of the film is that it's a little bit of just a slice of life. Like, you know, why does Herr Koenig start to build this resort? Well, he like vacations there one year and discovers, you know, the hooded woman or this cuckoo bird woman thing. And it's so just like, bloop, there you go. That's yeah. it. And like, there's not really this huge you know, master conspiracy by the government or all this kind of stuff. And I think you can infer different things like, you know, is it like an experiment? But I just felt like, oh, this is a world where there are weird monsters potentially. Yeah, we have perverted German scientists who discovers like mysterious human-like race of species and they're like, I want to preserve this species. I'm mm-hmm. going to create an environment where they can grow. And he brought Alma's parents, Gretchen's dad and his new wife there for their anniversary. And they... Conceived, they conceived but, Alma during that trip, and they're like, "Oh, how long has it been? She Eight got or nine slimed, years, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, she absolutely did More get slimed. So here's the thing: <laughs> she got slimed so, good. <laughs> Cuckoo has super speed, obviously, because uh-huh. she's running up with the girl on the bike. Okay. She's got super speed. She got she got wait. Sonic Attack. <laughs> <laughs> she does. She has super speed. She has a black canary cry. Yes, yeah. yes. but. If she has super speed, why couldn't she dodge that stab to the neck? I don't totally know. (laughs) I didn't even really pick up on, like, crazy super speed. Like, I feel like she has, like, you know, it's like, okay, we have, like, the Flash. I'll go out front and drive my bike down the street and see how long it takes you to catch up to me. It was a 10 speed. No, but she had her headphones on. She was just trying to, like, like, it was a lackadaisical kind of ride. She wasn't, like, sprinting home in the dark. (laughs) Listen, I'm not saying that she's not fast. I mean, like, I mean, can I run a like, you know, a six minute mile? Mm, sometimes, but I mean, I think she was like, she was sprinting, honey, yeah. like Olympic sprinter. Which was funny when I saw this <laughs> woman in a trench coat and a hairnet and glasses. Yeah. I was like, what is happening? Right? What is but this? Her, so and then her, her glowing eyes, and I'm like, this is eerie. Like, this is. This is successful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The design of the character. Because in, in description, it's like, hi, let's picture a <laughs> granny with a babushka and glasses <laughs> and like some dress on. And you're like, this is scary, but you it actually really was. was. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But it was scary. That whole reveal, like the, the cuckoo, you know, human species, my wig was evaporated. Yeah. Like, I could not believe this is where the road led to. Yeah, same. <laughs> like, to me, there's a couple of big reveals and it's like there's the reveal in the pool kind of the basement level house thing. Oh, where, yeah. Which I thought we were going to go in a very different direction. I'm so glad we didn't. What did you think was going to happen? I thought that it was going to be still like Hunter Schaefer's character is an unreliable narrator, but she's like trapped here and he's going to abuse her or torture her. And I was like, oh, no, this is not the movie I thought it was. Mm-hmm. But then when they reveal, it's like, oh, no, 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 no. The hospital is actually the research facility where we create these cuckoos. I was like, Oh my God, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah, so did they so want good. her to come in and slime Hunter Schaefer yes. so that Hunter mm-hmm. Schaefer would have a, another a cuckoo, cuckoo yep. baby? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Because yes. I was like, oh, I thought when they opened the door, I was like, oh, they just are like, come in and kill this bitch. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's like that. It's like a lion cage. Okay, wait. But you're sparking memories now because that character who air Kone calls out of the woods to come and slime Hunter Schaefer. That's the girl who jets into the woods in the yes. opening scene. So, yes. so she is another offspring. Like right. she is another cuckoo reaching yes. maturity. Yes, exactly. Okay. And there's a line in the movie that I really liked. It's, it's sort of a back and forth about when the cuckoos reach maturity, then they leave. But that one reached maturity early because there was some sort of issue because Alma's hormones got fucked up because Gretchen's mom dies. 
and then it creates all that chaos in their lives. Mm. And so Gretchen comes, and then there's this line where Gretchen's like, why me? And Harry Koenig is like, you're such a brat. Like, it's not about you. You're taking resources away from the cuckoo. Like, yeah. it's not even about you. And I was like, oh, it's so good. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. so it's so cool. So, I mean, uh, the story goes on to a little bit further. We'll leave maybe some pieces for listeners who haven't seen it yet and want to see it now that we've talked about it. Because, girl, it w- it's definitely worth a watch. But was it a successful horror movie? What did you think? Yes, Light. I would say yes. What was it terrifying? No, it was moody and atmospheric. Not all horror movies have to be terrifying, so it didn't scare me, but that's okay. I think it was very atmospheric. It was definitely of the horror genre. It just wasn't scary. Yeah, I think that's pretty accurate. I think it's more of a thriller, I guess, but mm-hmm. that's when you start to get into that, like, what's a horror, what's a thriller? Like, the, uh, the lines are so blurred at this point. Like, I think it squarely fits into horror. And it's interesting that this was made by Neon because a lot of their movies has that vibe. And you like a lot of their movies. I do, too. Yeah, Neon Possessor is, was from Neon. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff. Uh, Long Legs was. They've, they've been putting out a lot of great horror. They're kind of having a moment right yeah. now. Mm-hmm. What did you think, Swan? There were parts where I was scared. And there was definitely an atmosphere of being like nervous. And there's danger. And there's going to be violence or jumps. But I do also think it belongs in the thriller column, like fantasy too, almost, you know, like us. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it was just very interesting. I actually think it, it was like sort of like a chimera, right? It was made up of like two or three different type of animals. It was thriller. It was fantasy. It was a horror movie. It was and it was it was really fun. All right, everyone, we'll go and watch Cuckoo. It's in theaters right now. I think it might be on streaming by the time this podcast comes out or, you know. The kind of streaming where you have to pay $20 to watch it. (laughs) But that's all the time we have for this episode. Remember to write to us at creatures at BelayBrothersDragula.com and we will see you next episode. The Boulay Brothers Creatures of the Night is hosted and produced by Drachmorda and Swanthula Boulay, along with co-host Ian DeVogler, with music by Neuron Spectre.